Good day chaps. So as some of you might have noticed, there's been a bit of a lull in the videos here. This was down to my PC cooking itself, losing a CPU, power pack and a GPU all in one go. But thanks to some amazing support from the public and from figures like Cone of Arc, Spookston, the Armoured Patrol and Tanks Encyclopedia and many more, we're able to get the funds to get the parts. So for all those who donated, I'd like to say a huge thank you. I couldn't have done it without you. Now, I've got to play catch up, so let's dive straight back into the obscure tanks and projects that are out there. Today's video is going to be on a tank drawn up in 1974 at the 24th Long Armour Infantry Course at the Royal Armoured Corps Centre in Bovington, a follow-on from the School of Tank Technology courses. It's the Nemesis Main Battle Tank. The Nemesis, named after the Greek goddess of divine retribution, was a project that ran for 59 weeks, with primarily British officers from the Royal Armoured Corps, as well as infantry officers, and was open to both the US and some Commonwealth soldiers. As part of the course, they had to design a vehicle which would be assessed at the end and a decision made whether it would be worthy or not. The task given was to develop a non-European main battle tank, this was in light of the fact that many current tanks designed on the European market were built to face off against superior numbers of Soviet tanks. Thus, they were often heavier, more complex and more costly than was required elsewhere. There was, therefore, a large number of non-European countries that had a need for tanks of high quality but not designed to meet the specialised conditions of the European theatre. Any tank designed would thus need to have a wide appeal so that a large volume of sales would allow its production at a reasonable price. Nine officers were chosen to design the tank, using the knowledge gained over the previous year, as well as support from a wide variety of industrial leads, such as Vickers, Rolls-Royce and Envy, along with serving armour specialists from the UK, Germany and others. The first step undertaken was an assessment on the current nations who might be interested in the tank, what threats they faced, terrain types, and political ramifications of arming that nation, and how their neighbours would react, as well as previous relationships and the financial stability to place large orders, and what each nation felt would be the key benefits in a tank. The list of nations was set into three priority groups. Those with close ties with Russia or China were put to the bottom, as were nations likely to use their tanks in actions against their own people. The next step was to see what each nation wanted and assign a scale of importance averaged over each nation. The top requirements were for a low-cost tank, able to defeat both Soviet but also American vehicles. The need for night fighting equipment was high, while medium armour was more desirable than heavy armour. In the mid-levels, the engine requirements were mixed, but the ability to eliminate insurgents or light anti-tank teams was also present while at the low end was nuclear, biological and chemical equipment and a snorkel system. While some nations placed higher emphasis on certain bits, over 60 nations were assessed and the requirements on average were calculated. The team also had to evaluate the type of war. Over an average of the nations evaluated, the most desired traits were for a mobile offensive role in a conventional war with additional tasks in close fire support for infantry and anti-armoured defence against a superior force. Any vehicle needed to be effective out to 2,000 metres, often after a long distance march, in difficult environments, and be able to engage infantry and light armour quickly. The team also worked out the cost of what people were willing to pay, discounting the Soviet and Chinese vehicles offhand, as one was never going to be able to produce a better vehicle than the T-55 at a lower cost with parts. The vehicle was therefore chosen for comparison with the AMX-30 at 225,000, the S-Tank at 217,000, the Chieftain at 200,000 and the Vickers Medium at 103,000 and finally the M60 being the cheapest at just £72,000. They also looked at the current vehicles the British had that could be converted over to a new role. The trusty old Centurion was chosen first, but not deemed suitable. The vehicle had an estimated service life of 10 years left, even after a Vickers overhaul. The weight of 50 tonnes at the time could not be reduced without sacrificing too much, 
and the power to weight ratio of 13 to 1 was not desirable. Overall, to refurbish the Centurion would effectively make it unsuitable in several areas desired essential to the majority of customers. On the other hand, Chieftain at 200,000 was deemed too expensive, losing about 60% of the nations that would want to buy a tank, adding in its weight alone a further 30% of possible customers, while its low power to weight ratio further hindered it. The notion to give it a new engine would require a complete rework of the transmission as well, adding costs, while simplifying the contents to a budget meant a waste of Under Armour value. The Vickers medium tank Mark I was the most desirable on basic traits, with medium armour, good power to weight ratios, an affordable price and a proven ability to work in hot and humid climates. The only down factor was its mediocre mobility. With that said and done, the team then listed what the customers wanted overall, which should be used to design their new tank. There was a total cost required of £150,000, including spares for five years. A very high degree of reliability, with particular note to the ease of replacement of parts and minimal crew servicing level. A gun able to defeat the T-62 out to 1500 metres and 2000 metres was desirable, as well as high explosive and canister capability, and the highest possible accuracy and lowest acquisition times. Protection of the Nemesis was to be enough to stop the T-62 at 1500 metres and the sides to stop heavy machine gun and light handheld weapons, with the roof to protect against high explosive bursts and mine protection. And finally, the vehicle must ideally be below 40 tonnes, 35 if possible, and have a power to weight ratio of 25 to 1 and a road speed of 65 km an hour. The team then began to work on the Nemesis and looking at features wanted and what could be provided. They looked at the main weapon and debated over a gun or an anti-tank guided missile as these were popular at the time. It was decided that the vehicle had to be both anti-tank but also needed to engage light armour and infantry. Thus the pure guided weapon system wasn't an option. The gun missile system, such as that used on the M551 Sheridan, was also considered but quickly dropped. Not only would it take up more volume with less ammunition, but it added a layer of complexity and cost that was not needed. Thus a conventional high velocity gun was required. They also debated on whether the vehicle should be turreted or not. This has some pros and cons. The idea of a casemated vehicle was quickly dropped. While a casemated tank might have a few advantages as a tank destroyer in open countryside and in weight savings, it is extremely hampered by its mobility and utterly unsuitable for the potential close fighting and jungle conditions which the customers might want. The next choice were the pod style, which was somewhat fashionable in concepts of the period. The pod gun idea had the advantage of a reduced silhouette and a lighter build, as well as better crew protection, but comes with extra costs poor all-round vision, and the ammunition section is always vulnerable. Next up were either oscillating or cleft types. The oscillating turret with a two-part system had a simplified fire control system, smaller turret ring diameter, and an easy-to-fit autoloader, requiring less crew and a reduced silhouette in the hull-down position. The downsides were NBC ceiling and a larger power requirement for stabilisation, and only limited weight that could be supported by the trunnions. The last of the odd turrets was the cleft turret. Now these are quite interesting as both Centurion in the past has been proposed with a cleft turret and the tank that became the Chieftain, originally medium gun tank number two, also drawn up with a cleft turret, in which the turret is split with the gun in the middle traversing up and down. This offers a low silhouette in hold down positions and low weight ratios, but creates vision and loading issues. The pros and cons went back and forth and they even discussed the driver and turret concept which has been considered for some future main battle tank ideas. However the issue here is that the driver has problems with the turret facing to the rear. This requires either a built-in counter-rotating sub-turret or a series of vision devices such as CCTV attached to the front of the tank to let him see when in reverse. This idea was also dropped as it would add complexity and cost to the tank and require a degree of skill that might be out of limits for some nations. Ultimately, the deciding factor for many of these was also that the vehicle may well need to be built as a bridge layer or an avery with overhead bridges, 
all of which make the more interesting turret layouts more or less redundant. The choice of guns were listed as well. These were the British 76mm ARMD L5A1, the 105mm L7A1, the 110mm shotgun and the 120mm L11A3. The 110 long gun was still in development at the time and could not be passed over and the 76mm was quickly tossed in the bin as unable to perforate the front of a T62 at any range. The gun chosen was the 110mm shotgun, having better performance than the L7 and not the overkill of the 120. This would be fitted with a basic hydropneumatic recoil system, have 10 degrees of gun depression and 20 degrees of elevation. The ammunition capacity was to be 28 rounds of armour-piercing discarding sabo and 12 rounds of heat, with 2 rounds of smoke, and an added option of beehive rounds. The team felt that Hesh, other than having some useful effects against concrete, was not viable, and that it would be less and less effective in the future, which was rather progressive thinking for the UK at that time. The gun was to be fully stabilised for accurate firing on the move, However, the rangefinder was an issue. The team initially thought that a .50 ranging machine gun should be used, as this was the cheapest option. However, some customers might want a laser rangefinder, and so provision to fit and mount one would come as standard. Later on, the team dropped the idea of the .50, and they fitted an autocannon coaxial to the main gun. This was done to fulfil the role of anti-personnel and light anti-armour work, but could also work as a ranging gun. This coaxial cannons were considered, and they looked at 20mm, 25mm and the 30mm Raden. The former was dropped due to a lack of effective penetration, and the latter due to its bulky ammo and lack of a dual feed, as well as added strain on the loader. The coaxial cannon picked was the 25mm TRW6425 cannon, then under consideration for the Bushmaster program. This would have 64 rounds of high explosive, and 64 rounds of armour piercing fed into it, with a total of 428 rounds available in the tank. Thus the Nemesis could engage light armour, infantry and ranging options, all with one gun. The next step was in the protection layout. For this, like the rest of the project, various ideas were touted, from ceramic armour, dual hardness and liquid armour, however all of these were expensive or prohibited or too complex for many customers. At the end, they chose to go with dual steel and an aluminium concept, with the front being steel and the rear being aluminium, and the two explosively welded together, much as had been proposed for the MBT-80 and tested on the ATR-2 rig in that programme. The classic plate was 94mm thick, but very well angled back at 70 degrees, for 274mm of steel, while the lower nose was 177mm at 45 degrees for 250 millimetres. The upper hull sides were 100 millimetres thick, tapering down to 40 millimetres on the lower side, both in steel, and the rear was 89 millimetres and the decks 45 millimetres in aluminium. The turret front was well protected, with between 79 millimetres minimum and 339 millimetres at the thickest, with 89 millimetres on the sides and rear. And finally we have the mobility. Nemesis was required to have a road speed of not less than 65 km an hour with fast acceleration, good cross-country performance and reliability. The idea of a conventional petrol engine, while discussed, was dropped quickly, leaving diesels and gas turbines open for discussion, with MTU, Rolls-Royce and Caterpillar amongst the diesels suggested, and the Lycoming 1500 and Rolls-Royce twin turbine as the other options. The gas turbine was dropped due to the high fuel requirements, which is all fine and dandy if you're a large American formation, but less desirable for smaller nations with limited logistics. This left the diesels, and it was the 8-cylinder, multi-fuel, MTU-870 German engine that was chosen. Not only did it have a good weight to size, it was, in the team's opinion, a very well-made engine, and would be easy to install or remove in power pack changes. This would be coupled with an epicyclic gearbox and a torque converter. The Nemesis itself was never built, remaining a study concept, 
and the papers were downgraded from secret to confidential in 1984. Today, both the workbook and the model survive at Bovington Tank Museum. The model used to be displayed in the museum, with just future tank project written on it, which is not entirely true. And at some point, somebody has also decided to splat a load of black paint all over the model. As to the usual questions, could this be used in games? Well, it would probably best fit into World of Tanks as a new top-tier vehicle. However, whether it would be a medium or a heavy, by that game standards, is harder to place. It's fast and has a fairly rapid-firing gun with good penetration, but also heavier armour than many mediums. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And with that being said, it's time for me to scoot. I hope you enjoyed this video on another weird and obscure project, and until next time, toodle pip.